All right, welcome. So, hey there, welcome to my Twitch stream. I'm Jason, uh, streaming as Brain Better, and I'm here to talk about software stuff. So, today's stream is kind of a special one. Yesterday, uh, I got the chance to show off some of my code in a really cool environment uh, during last night's Loading Ready Live. Uh, played a little game where the members of Loading Ready Run were challenged to figure out which of two quotes really happened. Uh, basically, they were presented with a, qu a quote uh, from some of their actual extensive quotes database of things they've said on stream that chat clipped, and another quote that never happened. And some of those quotes were uh, scarily plausible. And the person giving both quotes uh, had some plausible backstory for each of them, and it was uh, the contestant's job to guess which one was real. And I'm very proud to say that in five rounds, they guessed two of them correctly, which means that the bot was more plausible than the real human quotes. Um, so I built that bot. That bot is mine. And what we're here to do today is talk about how that bot works, because we're living in the strange AI future where anybody with a computer and some patience and a large chunk of text can create a plausible AI that can talk about that sort of thing and that can generate text that seems realer than real. So how do we do it? Okay. So thing one is this bot was using GPT-2. So I'm going to preface all of this by saying I am not some kind of AI genius. I am, in fact, not even an AI researcher. I, uh, I'm, I am a software engineer. I am a developer. I have most of my focus is actually on building large scale systems, making them scalable and keeping them from going down. So if, you know, the websites you're using from my employer don't crash, that's uh, my work. But what this is about is actually about the ease of working with AI technology that's been put out by research groups these days. So I, in the AI field, am not a specialist. Uh, I just went and grabbed some cool tools from other people and played with them. And that's what we're gonna do today, right now. All right, so uh, let's start out. We'll take a look here. Uh, this is the bot, uh, as exciting as it is. Um, this is GPT Quote Generator my fancy little bot, uh, and it's here on GitHub. So the first cool thing is you can grab the code that I used, you can play with it yourself, you can build your very own alien bot that generates terrible quotes. And in fact, we're gonna do that right now here on stream. So let's do that. Um, starting out, this is programming. So we are gonna have ourselves a programming terminal. This is my lovely terminal on my laptop. Uh, let's go ahead, let's get rid of Chrome there. Let's find my cursor and get rid of Chrome. So what we've got here, this is just my terminal and I am not gonna run this on my local computer. Uh, we're just gonna start off by saying that because I did run this on my local computer. The bot, the, the quotes that uh, we're were seen on Loading Ready Live were generated on my computer, but the process for generating those quotes ran overnight and then some, uh, because my computer is not particularly optimized for doing this kind of AI work. Um, but computers that are optimized for this kind of AI work exist and can be purchased cheaply. So we're paying 90 cents an hour to Amazon to run a computer in the cloud that is optimized for this kind of AI work. And that's the computer we're gonna log into right here. So this machine, um, quickly talking through this command, we're gonna SSH connecting to it. This is the computer we're connecting to. You'll just, Amazon told me that's how to reach it. So I'm gonna trust them. And then I'm just doing this little thing here. This extra command is gonna be completely invisible to us the rest of the time, but it's gonna save out everything I do to a log file. Um, I'm gonna post those log files of everything that we did today up to my Patreon later connected with this. Uh, you don't need to pay any money to see them. I'm just putting them on my Patreon because that's a decent place to put that extra stuff. I'm trying to put extra content there because that seems to be what Patreon is for. So let's go ahead and connect. And we're presented with a whole bunch of options. So this part of the process seems just a little intimidating, but the important thing here that you need to know is that for this part of the process, I've actually given you instructions. So let's go ahead and take a look again at Chrome. What we've got here 
we, we're going to need an installation of Python 3.7.7. And we're also going to need, uh, if we look here, TensorFlow version 1, 1.15 ideally. Uh, so that tells us some things that we need here. Uh, so if we go back now and we take a look, and important thing here, TensorFlow later than 1.15 is not supported. And that's because I'm making use of some tools that other people put together to make it easier. Those tools haven't been updated for TensorFlow version 2. So we're stuck on TensorFlow version 1, which is not actually any less sophisticated than version 2. It's just no longer the one that they're actively developing. But that's okay. We don't need active development state-of-the-art type stuff. That does mean that maybe someday this code will no longer work unless it gets updated for version 2, but that's okay. We're playing with it today. So we're going to go ahead and jump back to that box, back to my terminal. Um, back to it. There we go. I really should rename that. All right, there we are. So looking at my terminal here, we're going to find the one in this giant thing. We need a TensorFlow with Python 3. We don't need to... TensorFlow 2. So this is TensorFlow 1 with Python 3. And here's the command they tell us to do to set up our environment. So we're just going to copy paste that command. Source activate TensorFlow P36 and my Mac doc jumps in to get in the way. Here we go. And all that's doing is setting up the environment. Um, so I'm going to say here Python is a little annoying in the sense that compared to many other programming languages, it's very hard for to get all of the things you need set up in Python in a way that doesn't interfere with any other copies of Python on your machine. I'm going to be kind of fast and loose around this here today because we're running on a VM that does nothing else. So I'm just going to get it working with the machine's installation. The instructions in the repo will give you a little bit more information about setting it up so it doesn't interfere with other things running on your computer, but we're just going to plow forward. All right, so right now, if we take a look at what's in this directory, we've got a whole bunch of stuff, but we don't have my GPT quote generator. So let's go ahead, jump back over here, bring up Chrome again, and it's on GitHub. So GitHub is, uh, I'm not gonna go deep into what GitHub is. GitHub is a place where we keep code, um, store code, version code, all kinds of cool stuff. But it does mean that if we grab this little copy URL here, and then we take that over into here and we say that we want to clone our code onto here, git clone. And we put in that URL that we got from GitHub. We are now going to pull that code right down onto this machine and done almost as fast as I can type it. So if you want to play with this thing, you can also go ahead, go here, um, github.com, Jay Woodica, that is me. I'm Jason Woodica, AKA Brain Better. Uh, and this, this repo is GPT quote generator with dashes between the words because you can't put spaces in a repo name. All right, so now we have this GPT quote generator directory. We're going to change into it. And let's see what we've got here. We've got, there's actually not very much here, is there? We've got a demo, a demo.py, which is the script that does this. Uh, we've got requirements.txt, which we'll use in just a second here, and the readme file, which is basically the thing that GitHub is showing us right here. So what we're going to do is step one, as the readme tells us, we're going to skip to step five. Basically, steps one through four were kind of replaced by that thing we just did from Amazon's instructions. And then step five here is just going to go get the things we need. So pip install dash r requirements.txt. We'll let that happen. And it's just going to take a couple moments and pull some additional things down onto the system we're going to need. Um, and while it does that, I'll actually, I can talk you for through just slightly what it's going to grab for us here. Uh, if we look at requirements.txt, we basically use four things. We're using GPT-2 Simple, which is a tool that wraps GPT-2 to make it easier to use, like the name implies. We're using Fuzzy Wuzzy, which is a fuzzy matching uh, string thing. And I apologize for the name, which I have found out has some horrible connotations in Britain, um, because Rudyard Kipling ruins everything by turning it into a slur. Uh, I'm from the States, much like the developers of this tool. And all I know is the uh, the nursery rhyme that uh, you know my parents told me when I was a kid. Uh, apparently, it has other meanings elsewhere. So that package may change names someday, but that's something difficult to do with Python. 
We've also got this Python Levenstein, which basically is used by the fuzzy matcher to do uh, edit distance. Uh, Levenstein distance is an algorithm for figuring out how far apart two pieces of text are from each other. And later in this process, we're going to show you this system is going to check these quotes for plagiarism because sometimes GP2 gets really enthusiastic about quoting its source material. Finally, plaque here is something we're going to use to give ourselves a command line to make it a little easier to run this tool without editing the code every time we change what we want it to do. Um, that said, this script is super new and we are probably going to end up having to edit the code at some point tonight because it doesn't do everything already that I want it to do. So if we decide we want to experiment further with it, we may end up digging into the guts of the code. All right, so that's all that requirements was doing and requirements has finished installing. So now we've got it. We can run the script by saying Python and then telling it to run the script, which is demo.py, not pemo.py, demo.py. And we're just going to say dash dash help so we can ask it how it works because we did put a command line on it. So it'll give us some info on what it can do. And here we go. Slowly. So the first time this kicks off, it is basically setting up TensorFlow, um, which is substantial. It will always take a little while to launch because TensorFlow is big and AI-y and full of interesting data. But the very first time it launches is a little longer than the rest. And for absolute clarity here, I have basically never touched this computer before just now. I spun up this particular EC2 instance in the cloud about half an hour before we went online and confirmed I could connect to it and then didn't do anything with it so that we could do the whole setup process right here. That does mean that this one step is going to be slow. Uh, there it goes, past that important part. And one other thing, we are not going to make ourselves wait through everything. I do have a second instance lying around that we can connect to in a little bit that has already done a bunch of cool training. But that instance will jump to after we've seen how we got this all set up, because the setup is pretty cool if you want to play with it yourself. All right, and here we go. This tells us everything we need to know if you like reading command line arguments. Uh, I don't love reading command line arguments, but we're here. So this can do a few things. We can automatically download the model if we need to. This is absolutely the baking show with two ovens. In fact, uh, if you take a look at the files on my computer, uh, here, I'll show you. These two instances in EC2 here uh, are raw and cooked. So we are currently connected to raw. And in a little while, we will go ahead and connect ourselves to cooked, which has a whole chicken in it, which is amazing since we're putting tofu into raw. Um, that is a reference to the previous Loading Ready Live with a great bit from Beach. Um, so, all right, back to our system here. So we're doing a few, we can do a few things. Auto download, will go ahead and get that GPT-2 model from the web before we run it. We need to do that once. Uh, fine tune is used to run a fine tuning uh, pass on the model. So that's actually the process of training it. We are not training it in general. We are not going to be training from the beginning because we are beginning with a model that has already been trained a bunch. And our whole process is we're just going to add a little bit more training on the top of that. Resume will let us pick up from the past. We'll do that a bunch. Skip plagiarism. We'll talk about that when we get to it. We do some plagiarism checks. They are very slow. So if we know that we're doing things that really can't be picked up by that, we, are, we can skip that. There are multiple versions of GPT-2. We're going to use the 124M, which is the small one. It has only 124 million parameters. There are others. They are bigger. They work better, but they take more memory and are slower. Uh, so we got great results using the smallest. Uh, we'll give our runs names so that we can keep track of them. And then the rest is kind of controls how much we do. So the important thing here is we can give this some commands and try some stuff. So we've just got one problem right now. If we take a look on our drive here, ls, well, we could feed it requirements.txt. We could feed it the readme, but there's no big file of quotes on this machine yet. So we're going to need to send these quotes to this machine so we can play with it. We can do that. I'm going to switch over to a, a different window here. This one is in my local copy. And if we take a look at the directory here, we can see that there's a directory here called inputs. And if we look in the inputs directory, I've got three files there. Uh, quotes from loading ready run, Pokemon moves, and a little bit behind my browser, there's a Pokemon species file, because we've got the quotes that we use to generate the things for the show. And then I also grabbed some stuff about Pokemon, because there was a great database that had every Pokemon description and the description of every Pokemon move uh, up there on the web. And so that feels like it'll be fun to try playing with a little. So we'll play with that a little later uh, in the stream. 
but right now we just need to get this stuff up onto our machine. So SCP, secure copy. We're going to SCP inputs, and we're going to SCP it to EC2 user. It's an underscore, isn't it? No, nope. or is it a dash? I don't remember. One of these will be wrong. We'll find out. And we're just going to go jump over here, grab the name of the raw machine. Do, do, do. Hey, there's its DNS. And if you happen to have my SSH keys, which you don't, you could connect to this machine too, but you don't, so you can't, um, which is probably for the best. So we're going to connect to that there, and then colon. We're going to go ahead and put that those files into GPT dash. Uh, what is the name of this uh, directory? Oh, quote generator. Quote generator. Whoops, and we want to say this is relative to the home directory, so tilde slash GPT quote generator slash. And what should happen is we'll move that inputs direct, we'll copy that inputs directory up to there. Let's see if that works. Inputs is not a regular file. Um, right. Let me see, can I do uh, input slash star? There we go, we've moved those three files up to GPT quote generator. Let's go ahead and take a look now, jump back onto the machine in the cloud. If we ls, now we have these three CSV files here. To keep these separated from the many, many files we're going to be generating during this run, I'm going to go ahead and create a new inputs directory. And then we're just going to move star.csv into the inputs directory. And there we go. Now they're all sitting in the inputs directory. So now let's start out by not generating a model. Let's not train GPT. And we're going to just play with this a little. We're going to see what happens if we uh, just have GPT do some stuff for us. So let's, uh, let's see. Actually, that's a terrible idea because my script assumes that some training stuff has happened that has already occurred. So we're not going to do that because I just remembered that uh, it will cause my script to blow up spectacularly. And I'll explain why in a little while. Um, we're going to actually do a training. So we have, we'll do Python, demo.py. And now we have all those great commands we know from earlier. We're going to need to auto download because it doesn't already have the uh, model that we want. And we'll only need to do this for the very first one of these runs. After that, it'll have been downloaded. We're going to fine tune. We are going to uh, use a run name. And let's go ahead and call this run name, I don't know, Lure quotes, LRR quotes. And that'll let us pick this back up later. Um, now we need to choose how many steps we're going to run. So this is basically how many passes of training does it do? Uh, for the stuff that uh, ran on Loading Ready Live, I believe that was about 600 passes of training, though I honestly don't remember. I have done a lot of experiments at different levels. Too little training and it doesn't yet get coherent. It doesn't really represent, uh, it doesn't generate quotes correctly yet. Too much training and it becomes like that friend of yours that always just quotes things because they've got every line from a movie memorized. And it's not really funny anymore because it's just saying what they already said. So we really are looking for that sweet spot where it can interpret the quotes and come up with new quotes that match the style. So for that, I'm going to say, let's start, since this also does take time, every one of these, uh, these samples or every one of these steps is going to take about... Uh, about five seconds on this machine, which I'm going to say is remarkable. On my computer, they take significantly more than five seconds each to run. They take a couple minutes each, which is why we're doing this on AWS. So let's uh, let's say that we're going to run, I don't know, steps. Let's say step, let's say 400 steps. Uh, so n samples is how many chunks of text it generates. This is now, there's a little bit of an artifact. Every sample will generate a bunch of a bunch of quotes, uh, it'll generate about half a screen's worth. So let's uh, let's have it generate like three of these uh, at the end. And apparently uh, my echo really uh, liked something I said there. Okay, end samples, three. And let's see what we got here now. Um, 
last things here, it's going to save every 200 steps. That's useful in case something fails. We can pick back up where we left off. And then sample every is however many, this, every this many steps, it'll pause the training and it'll spit out some results so we can take a look at how it's doing. And it's going to sample every 100 by default. That's pretty good. Let's go with that. And I'm not going to bother telling it the output file because it, it builds a pretty good one based on what we give it. So actually, wait, yes, I am. Output file. Ah. quotes onecsv because I just remembered the way it builds it might not work well now that I've moved the input files into a directory. Inputs. And so we're going to give it as its input file this dump of the lure quote database as of 0503 of this year. So well, let's see, yeah, about a month ago. All right, and we hit go. Now, if I've done everything correctly, TensorFlow starts up. It goes, it's downloading that uh, giant model, which is yeah, pretty good on anything. And key error, quote, oh dear, oh dear. Well, so that's not good. That means that something in my code is broken. Um, well, this is why live coding is exciting. So um, I'm just going to check one quick thing, which is we're going to find out uh, if things work better if we move these things back out of a subdirectory. So CP inputs, and we're just going to move that to this directory, and we're going to try this again with the file not in a subdirectory, just in case it didn't read it correctly from the subdirectory. No, it doesn't like that. OK, well, time to live debug. All right, so uh, we've got the code here that actually is running. And the code we're running on this box is exactly the code that we pulled down from GitHub, which means we can use this to look at the code. And it says that the problem here is in line 65 on, yeah, line 65 in main, key error quote. So, okay, what it's saying, I can tell you what that means, is that right here, we're trying to add, uh, so the key error means that quote isn't in this row. And we're trying to add the row to the source quotes file. So wonder why there isn't a, oh, oh, I know the problem. Okay. I know exactly, I, I encountered this problem before and I made a mistake. So earlier when I was working with this file, I had to add a header to it so that it knew what the columns were because the original database dump that I got from Loading Ready Run was older, but it had column headers. This database file didn't have column headers, and I had been working with one copy of it, and I must have copied an older version of it to the server here that doesn't have the column headers on it yet. So let's go ahead and take a look at our input file. So uh, we're just going to get rid of the copy that's in this directory, and we're going to open up the copy that's in the other directory. And we're going to quit because I forgot to hit tab. There we go. All right, so, oh, ID quotes a trib name date notes. I see our problem here. So if you remember, what it said before was that it was looking for a column named quote, and this file's column is named quotes. So I apparently messed up when writing the default on this at some point, and I missed an S. That would explain it. So computers, they're very good at doing exactly what you tell them. And if we told it to look for a column named quote, and it found a column named quotes, and those just aren't the same, clearly. All right, so that's fine. What we're gonna do, I'm actually gonna fix that for real in the code. So jump over to my code editor, here we go. Look at this uh, default uh, quote column, there it is. It thinks its name is quote. Let me, I'll hide my Chrome so you can see that. So right here, it thinks the default name for this should be quote, but it isn't. The default name for that should be quotes. We're gonna save that. We're going to jump back over here. We're going to go to a directory on my machine. All right, um, git status, git diff. So we can see the only change we've made is we've updated an S. We're going to add that file to what we're going to send. Git commit. Give it a description of what we're committing. And the message will be fix plurals. Then we'll send that up to GitHub. We'll jump back over to our other computer where we're working. 
We'll pull that down from GitHub. All right. And then let's try this again, now with code that knows what uh, the correct column name is. And that is pointed at the inputs directory again. OK, so this time it loaded 6828 quotes attributed to 280 sources. And for a quick sort of uh, check of the data, it tells us who the top 10 sources were in the data set. Um, that's mostly uh, for trivia right now. Later, I plan to play around with this a little to try teaching it to do quotes in the style of just one person, because we do have enough to play with that a little. But for right now, the important thing there is it's found it. It's got it started, and what we're going to do is now train. So what I'm looking for now, once the training begins, we should start to see some actual updates appearing here. Um, just like before, the very first time we actually kick TensorFlow off to do work, it again is doing a whole bunch of setup under the hood. Uh, this is only going to happen once, to the best of my knowledge. I mean, it always does just a little bit of work, but it always seems to take longer the first time. I'm going to be perfectly honest, I have no idea what it's doing at this phase. Um, but it does seem to do something the first time you run it in an environment. So it's just a little slower. I keep forgetting about that because it turns out you only set it up the first time once, and then you keep reusing it. So remembering that the first time is slow is one of those things I keep doing when I get back to the first time. All right, so while this starts off, let's actually talk through a little bit what is happening. So, ah, here we go. Loaded the checkpoint, loaded the data set, found the data set, and now it's begun to train. So this is going to be one of the least exciting parts of this. So I'm going to let this kick off in the background here, and we're going to look at, uh, let's bring up Chrome again while we work. We'll just keep that kind of going in the background so we can keep an eye on it. So here's what this code's doing. I'm going to take a quick tour of the code just to kind of demystify it. All of this is, this whole section up here is just the various things you can tell it, you know, the various arguments you can give the program, instructions for how to run, and it's a description of them and then a default value for each of them. So this program will basically run with defaults most of the time. The only thing you need to tell it, the only one it absolutely won't run without, is you need to tell it a source file. Um, and even that may change in the future, as you don't necessarily need the source file that you're going to generate and not check for plagiarism. Uh, but I haven't put any real effort into making the uh, interface nice and clean, because I'm the only person who ever uses it so far. We tell it a few other things. We tell it uh, where to go find the models. We tell it where it's going to write a temporary file that it's going to use for input, because it's going to take these quotes and put them into a format that it works better with for training. And then it's going to print out some info. It'll go get that model, download it. If we didn't turn auto download on, it won't download it for us, just so that we don't accidentally do a huge download when we didn't mean to, just by typoing or something. Then it's going to go through all the quotes, opens up the quote file, opens up that temporary input file it's using, and it takes all of the quotes and it just writes back out the quote itself into the other file. So that we end up with one, going from one file that has like a quote and a date and a time and all that extra information to a file that is just quote, 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 quote. Um, then the fun part comes. We start up the GPT-2 session. We basically, that was where we saw it connecting to GPT-2, that all the startup with TensorFlow and then loads the model, and we give it a whole bunch of information and tell it to fine tune. So this is hiding a ton of cool logic, because after this fine tune project is done, once this, once this one little piece of code finishes, it knows how to talk like our data set. Uh, and in fact, the, the majority of what we're doing, like hours of work are all just hidden here in this function that I didn't write, that I just call, uh, that was provided to us by another library. Uh, and then it's going to go generate the quote. So let's dig into what's actually happening here. So first thing here is uh, GPT-2. Before we get to GPT-2, let's talk a little bit about text generation. So basically, what's going when we do text generation, what's going on is we're basically trying to predict what the next words will be in some piece of text. And 
before we did this GPT-2 generator, uh, the LRR folks, this is not their first time playing with fake quotes. So before they played with this fake quote generator, the fake quote generator they used was something called a Markov chain. And a Markov chain is basically a simple mathematical model of language. And they were using a word-based Markov chain. And the whole idea of a word-based Markov chain here is, imagine here, you know, this is, this is my cell phone. I have a predictive keyboard, like, you know, basically everybody. And after I've written a couple of words, it's going to guess what word I'm going to write next. And a Markov chain generator can work basically like that. Based on, you know, the simplest one would be a one-word Markov chain generator, uh, a unigram. We sometimes call these n-grams, where n is like, you know, little italicized number, you know, variable. So a unigram is just one word. So a unigram Markov chain generator says, if this word came before, what is the next word? And that doesn't capture a lot of the structure of language because, you know, lots of words, that does great with many things, but like the fact that you can put not in front of many words and change their meaning means that a word that had not before it, there the Markov chain has no knowledge that that is different than the word without not before it. So, okay, we can make the Markov chain a little smarter. We can have it look at pairs of words, bigrams, or three words in a row, trigrams. And these Markov chains get a little bit better at predicting, but the first thing is, well, one, they never will choose a word they've never seen come after these other words. And two, they get into kind of a weird place if they've never seen, let's say we have a trigram-based Markov chain, and it's never seen these particular three words in a row before. Well, all it can do is fall back to the bigram, the, the later two words, and say, well, have it seen those? And yeah, as Warpammer is saying here, these, this was the thing in the 90s. This was like the state of the art. Um, and this is just a statistical model of language. But one of the problems is it doesn't have a lot of sophistication. Um, but by looking at it, we can kind of think about a couple of the concepts that are going to be in play for this system. First of all, the goal is to predict what will happen next. That's all that we're trying to do here is given some set of words, we want to guess the next word. This is pretty cool. So... And, oh, yes, uh, generating names. Letter bigrams and trigrams are more predictive than words are. Yes, uh, letter-based uh, generative Markov chains are pretty cool, like at that, those lower levels. And there are other things that Markov chains are really good for. Like, they are actually, they are still in use. They're still a very reasonable thing. But one of the things is that the state of text generation and plausible text generation has moved on. Um, so what we're doing, though, it's still basically the same thing. We're still saying, based on some set of stuff, we want to predict the next thing. But instead of using a Markov chain, which is just a very simple statistical model, we're going to use GPT, which is a generative predictive transformer. So let's break that down. Generative. Okay, we want it to create text. Its job is not to just look at some stuff and classify it and decide what it is. Its job is to generate new items. Predictive because it wants to base it on the past things. It wants to predict the most likely new item, and we train it by giving it text where we know what word comes next and seeing how good a job it does of guessing the correct next word. And transformer, because the class of model this is, mathematically, is called a transformer model. So you've heard of neural nets, you've heard, you know, there's Markov chains as we talked about. GPT is a transformer model. Now, I'm going to be super honest with you right now. I don't know what a transformer model actually is mathematically. Uh, one of the refrains that you'll hear if you hang out with me a bunch is that math is not my strong suit. Um, and that's fine. I get to use really sophisticated math as a programmer without actually being particularly sophisticated at math as a programmer. Um, but the transformer class of models broadly work in the same general way as things like neural nets, where you take some input, you get an output, and it's more than meets the eye. Oh my god, I can't believe that I didn't make that joke before chat got to it. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so yeah, the transformer model, though, it's, it's basically the same thing of you take the input, you take the output, and then if, the, if it generates the correct output from the input, you reinforce the hidden model stuff inside it that did that. And if it generates the wrong output for that input, you weaken it a little. So the idea is you run it over and over, and every time it's right, you say, whatever parts of your code did that, 
we like those. And every time it's wrong, we say, whatever parts your code did that, mm, not so good. Uh, there are some great videos, by the way, on YouTube about how to train neural nets. And if you were to watch those, I strongly recommend them. I'm certainly not going to give as good an explanation of that live as they will with like nice graphics and things pre-planned. The important thing to understand is that all we're basically doing is we're telling it a bunch of things we already know, and we're asking it to learn how to do them. So here we go. We've got now the first 100 batch. And you can see even after 100 batch, a couple things have happened. So thing one, these start of text and end of text things are introduced by our system. Uh, one of the key things that they're doing is that they are taking a system that's built to generate entire paragraphs of text and breaking those paragraphs into little quotes. So every quote we fed into the system actually had this start of text, end of text thing stuck in front of it before it began. So in 100 rounds, it hasn't necessarily learned everything. Um, but what it has learned is that quote, everything that it matters begins with start of text and ends with end of text. OK, that makes sense. A um, couple of other things we're going to see. You can see there's there's some themes running through here, and I uh, I can't read some of these quotes and retain my stream rating. So you can see once it starts thinking about a subject, it will continue to keep quotes about that subject. And that's because one of the things GPT itself has trained in well is that good text, good chunks of text, have consistency within them. So once you've got some topic, that topic is going to continue to happen uh, over and over. So let's actually take a moment. We're going to digress a little and go play with GPT before I did horrible things to it. So going back to here, we have, so this is uh, Talk to Transformer. Uh, so Talk to Transformer is also built on top of GPT. Uh, the difference is where the, what I did is I loaded GPT and you saw the very first thing we did with it was we began fine tuning it on a new data set. Talk to Transformer, loads GPT and then says, OK, now we're going to see what happens. We're just going to let you put in some quotes and have it finish it. So let's give GPT a quote. And uh, all right. Um, just to make it really clear, we're going live here and I have no idea what's going to happen. I'm taking it's more than meets the eye from quote from chat. And so here, if we take a look at this, um, so actually, oh, is it correct to say it's building sequentially rather than as a gestalt? Take a look, watch, you'll actually see an example of what it's doing. You'll see how it kind of does that when we ask talk to transformer to do this. It's more than meets the eye. So it's more than meets the eye and it's going to begin filling out from there. And because I've been playing with uh, Talk to Transformer a bit, it keeps thinking I'm a bot because I keep asking it to do things for me. So we're just going to verify that. Very ironic, we have to uh, you know, tell the bot we're not a bot to get the bot to bot at us. All right. Wow, Talk to Transformer is being slow today. We may not be able to get an example out of Talk to Transformer today, uh, but I was kind of hoping so. It's true, only one bot in the conversation. So, and this one, by the way, you can see here, this is the full-size GPT-2 model. Ah, there we are. It was more than meets the eye. Only Lucas could fix them. And then it started to go into credits for a movie. Okay, I'm... I'm going to ask you to try that one again. But what, one of the things you saw there is it did, it generated that in chunks. Uh, each chunk is generated kind of as a little gestalt from what it did, but then the chunks are sequential. And each one is fed by giving it the sum of all the things it generated up to that point and asking it to do another. So let's generate another and hopefully get something a little bit less uh, film script. I don't know. So yeah, my suspicion is that Talk to Transformer is a little more slammed today than uh, past times. OK, so apparently it has decided that uh, it, it, it's decided it's doing an article about Jewish business. Um, I have no idea what this is coming from. This actually is a great opportunity to talk about uh, 
you know, bias in AI as well. We have, whenever we kick one of these guys off, we have no idea what it's going to do. And it was trained on the internet, which means while this does at least appear to be uh, to, from like possibly a Jewish newspaper or something, we really have no idea when it brings up a word like Jewish, whether it's going to be positive or whether it's going to be horribly racist. Robots. So, yeah, it also has noticed that news articles, when put to text, frequently have the word advertisement in the middle of them, where an ad failed to render and its alt text appears. So you can really tell this was trained on the internet. Um, there are some interesting quirks in Transformer. But you can see it's, it knows a lot of things, and I'm going to try running a demo that uh, I ran earlier here. Um, we're just going to say... Harry pointed his wand at his opponent, and so one of the things I've just done here, you'll notice I've given a first name, I have not given a last name, and but I've mentioned a wand. So, and yep, it, it did what I thought it would, we got Draco. So. The most common use of Harry in the context of magic is Harry Potter fanfic. Um, one of the interesting things here that I just want to point out is this is, in fact, an ambiguous prompt because there is also Harry Dresden from uh, Jim Butcher's The Dresden Files, who also uses a wand and is also named Harry and could totally point his wand at an opponent. But this thing established the context generally that's most common. And so it recognized... It's going to use this name a bunch of times. It brought in the name Draco, and then it continues to use it repeatedly. Um, but also, if we take a look at this, this is kind of incoherent. Harry pointed his wand at his opponent, and he suddenly lashed out and launched a spell at him. Harry took the hit like a pro, turning his body into a protective barrier of light around the spell and taking it with him. Draco sputtered with pain and slumped to his knees, nearly losing consciousness at the unexpected power that Harry wielded. Why? Uh... Did, did Harry attack Draco? I think we missed that. Harry had managed to move both arms with some dexterity and dexterous use of his wand. True stray feathers then fell from his back. Huh? Pounced off and slammed into the ground in front of Harry. Wait, wait, they they, they fell from his back, bounced off, and slammed to the ground in front of him? I'm, I'm having some trouble picturing what's happening in this scene here. He picked them up, explained the spell he was casting, and pointed them at Draco, who, unlike most wizards, couldn't hold back his laughter. Harry passed them back to Draco. Wait, but, but weren't they Harry? How can he pass them back to... Who twitched from laughing so much that he... Yeah, this is about as coherent as an unedited fanfic. This is a very unedited fanfic. Um, and you can see it's actually... At a surface level, you read this and all of the... Sen the sentences are there. And, huh, couldn't is... You're right, couldn't is misspelled. Nice catch, Kyvex. So this thing, again, it talks like the internet. It's trained on the internet. Oh, God, is it the internet? So... The coherency of this is all a little bit weak. That said, what we're basically doing here is going through this and we're teaching this one particular set of text that it can use, that it, we're asking it to train with its knowledge of the structure of grammar and the structure of how sentences play together. We're just teaching it now that it should generate sentences of a particular type. We don't get to, we don't, Neither, we neither get to nor want to remove the pre-existing training, but we're on top of that saying, now aim towards this one thing. So that's kind of what we're getting when we play with it ourselves. Now, we've just gotten through another 200. We've got another batch of uh, stuff here, but we'll look at those in a little bit. I'd like to look at those all together, I think, so we can look at how it's done over the course of training. Um, so now... That's enough with talk to Transformer. I do want, by the way, I'm gonna just do some quick a quick tour of some other cool things here. Um, this actually came up today on. Uh, whoops, nothing I meant to do a thing. This is Janelle Shane. Uh, she wrote the book "You Look Like a Thing and I Love You." And if you have uh, seen AI Weirdness on Twitter at AI Weirdness, uh, that is Janelle Shane. She is an actual AI researcher, unlike me. Uh, but she also makes AI say stupid things, just like we're doing here today. Um, and she's very good at it. 
Uh, so one of the things, if you want, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, I really recommend you go take a look at her work because she's funny and she's good at this. And she's there to teach you about how AI works. And I also really have to give some credit to Max Wolf, uh, Minimaxer, who wrote the GPT-2 simple wrapper that we are using to do all of this today. So again, he's building on top of GPT-2. And if we go take a look at GPT-2 simple, his code, um, one of the things that you'll see here, whoops, this is my code, this is his code. I said, this is his code, would you please load the window? Um, don't know why it was in that. Oh, I think I was debugging something earlier. Back to here. So he gives some information here about how to use it. And he is bringing in stuff, model management from OpenAI's official GPT-2 repo. So OpenAI are the folks who built GPT-2. I'll show you that in just a moment. Uh, Neil Shepard forked GPT-2 and added fine tuning, which he pulled in here. And then some text generation output management from something that he also built. So you can see here, this is all kind of built on top of other people. We're all, this is a conversation between programmers who are effing around with AI. We're just here playing with this stuff being silly. So let's go take a look at OpenAI, by the way, because the, the folks who actually built this, uh, uh, GPT-2 OpenAI. Just gonna quick search for that. Hopefully Google's not gonna be weird at us. There we go, better language models and their implications. So this is the kind of the big article that OpenAI put out uh, a few years ago now, uh, maybe a year ago. I don't know, Every time has lost all meaning in uh, the quarantine times here. Um, so what they've done, okay, yeah, they put this out, wow, yeah, just a little over a year ago, February, 2019. So they actually released this model in chunks. So the first, the one that we're using, the small model, was the only one they released at first because they were concerned about the implications of being able to generate fake text this effectively. And yeah, all that it was trained to do was predict the next word in 40 gigs of internet text. And at the time, they were not releasing the trained model at that time. Oh yeah, those, those rainbow word streams in the top are beautiful. And if you zoom in on that picture, by the way, if you go to this article, they're all different uh, things the AI generated from the samples below. Uh, I actually really respect, OpenAI has a great graphic design team and I just, A plus, primo, beautiful. Um, so, you know, this is, they've got a whole bunch of examples of what they got their model to output these are slightly cherry-picked, but they at least tell how many tries it took to get these things here. Uh, and there's just a whole bunch of these here. And you can kind of page through them here with this little thing. Uh, I'm not going to go super deep on this, but everything we've done, everything we're doing, is all based on GPT-2 at the and the OpenAI group's research. Uh, and these folks are awesome. I am going to also point out here, there are currently some videos going around that uh, are using their latest thing, which I have not yet played with, called Jukebox, which actually takes a sample of audio and continues the song. And there is a video kicking around where you can get Rickrolled by an AI because they keep starting with a little bit of uh, Rick Astley's Never Gonna Give You Up and letting the AI go and seeing how long it takes from it predicting off its own predictions before it kind of degrades. So it's pretty cool. Um, it's interesting. That's their current newest research. But uh, I have not playing with that because I had a quote database, not a bunch of music. So back out of that, back out of Max's site, back out of AI weirdness. Uh, two other things I just want to point out here. Again, some similar implications of this. We've got this person does not exist. So this is a site using a different type of AI called a generative adversarial network, which these are a lot of the state of the art for generating fictional images right now is generative adversarial networks, uh, GANs. So if you see GAN, G-A-N, uh, that's what that is. And the whole idea of a generative a adversarial network is it's kind of a pair of AIs fighting. One AI is trying to build a picture that is similar, would fit in the category of other pictures. So in this case, in the category of faces. Another AI has been trained to recognize faces and its training is we train it on real faces and faces generated by the other system. And every time it gets one wrong, we tell it, you know, we tell it to get better. So 
it's basically two AIs in an arms race, one trying to build better faker images, the other trying to detect the fake images from the real ones by any subtle means that might be available in the image. And if you grab a couple of these, what you'll see here is like, these are really plausible. And I want to emphasize, these aren't photos. These are generated by an AI. These aren't real. As the website says, this person does not exist. Um, so if you need like character portraits for your next role-playing game, and you don't mind the fact that they're all going to be white uh, because bias in AI, um, well, they won't all be. They just will mostly be. See, I say that and then bam. But uh, yeah, that is one of the things here. Yeah, it is a bit like the arms race between, yeah, your spam filter versus the spammers. So this is where the state of the art is in pictures. So I'm just saying this because we are living right now through an AI explosion where the ability to generate new systems is kind of terrifying. Um, these things are just scarily realistic in a lot of ways. I mean, this one you can kind of tell is fake because of this thing in the background here on the right that just... What is that object? It isn't. And that's stuff that isn't the face in the picture. The parts that are the face, really on. And there's those other stuff, you know, cats. Let's see. I hit, I've never hit the cats one, but yeah, this cat does not exist. There you go. We have a cat that doesn't exist. Fake cats. <laughs> it's the internet. Fake cats. All right. Um... And then the other one of the other things we've got here are StyleGAN, which is this is a portrait AI, and this one also has this one has some significant uh, because of course the data set of uh, classical portraits is very uh, racially biased. Uh, this one will basically make anybody white, but uh, this one is again a StyleGAN basically picks up uh, oh yeah this waifu this persona the two that uh, trained on anime art trained on furry art yeah there are a whole bunch of these the art ones are really interesting StyleGAN is fascinating because its whole idea is we can not only generate a completely synthetic image but we can take an image we can separate the portion of it responsible for its style from the portion of it responsible for the content and have the AI attempt to preserve the content as much as possible from one image while applying the style as much as possible from another. So yeah, this is kind of fascinating on that. And this is in the style, that's a style GAN is the name of that network, again, G-A-N. So we know it's a generative adversarial network. We've got a sense of the technique it's using, but this is all a little orthogonal to what we're doing today. We're playing with GPT and Transformer. So let's go ahead, close that stuff down, and take a look at what we've got. So let's see how our terminal's doing here. So we have just finished our 300-somethingth uh, iteration. Um, and you can see here, we actually see a couple of artifacts here. So first of all, you see this, you know, starter text, I want to create my file that has just terminated because there is a barrier on the size it can do. It can only generate a certain amount of size at a time. We've told it to generate, I believe, a one kilobyte of text at a time. And so wherever it stops, it stops. And you'll also see when it begins, since we've given it no seed data, you saw before when we were using uh, Talk to Transformer, we gave it seed data. We told it what we expect to see in the data. And when we did that, we basically got stuff that followed from there. We're cheating by and not giving it seed data because we've added these really strong constraints that everything's got to begin with this start of text, end of text. But it doesn't necessarily know where to begin in there. So it'll generate some random stuff and then eventually figure out, oh, I've been talking for too long. I need an end of text. And after an end of text, we know that right after an end of text always has to be a start of text. And so you see it's gotten pretty good at that. It, it basically never fails to put stuff between start of text, end of text, new line. Like, it knows that pattern. It's gotten into that groove real well. Um, and, yeah. Uh, so one of the things we've also got here is we, as the, the further this goes, the more likely it is to be quoting something real from the database. So some of these are really good. And one of the questions then we have to start to ask, and how we got started with the, the anti-plagiarism code, which I'll show you in a little bit, is I was just like, okay, okay, right here. Um, where was the one that I thought was super real here? You know, uh, what's something that seems uh, pretty realistic here? 
I'm going to invade your personal space. That sounds like the sort of thing that one of the lure folk would say on stream and it would get quoted. So let's go ahead and jump over to the source data. I'm going, I'm going to invade your personal space. All right, well, we've got my editor here in the same directory that I keep all the files. We've got the quotes file, let's load it up. And we're just gonna search this. I'm going to, and as we can see, I'm going to invade your personal space. Graham said that. So the AI is learning to quote, uh, learning to quote bits that are already there. Uh, so that's one of the risks that we get with this kind of training, because remember, oh, you know, OpenAI, new mouth, new words. Let's start that sentence over. So, so OpenAI trained GPT-2 on four gigabytes of internet text. That's what it took to get, you know, that kind of diversity in the text. Uh, we are training on, well, let's see here. Um, let's just go ahead. Reveal this file in Finder for me, please. Hey, Mac, where'd you put that new Finder I just asked for? Is it over here? I don't know. There it is. It just took forever to open. There we are. So, so yeah, GPT-2 trained on gigabytes of text, four gigabytes. Our quote file is 480 kilobytes of internet text. So yeah, that's a that's a big file right there. There's enough data that GPT is more than capable of completely memorizing this file. So this is called overtraining, where basically the network you're trying to build, instead of finding the underlying patterns in your data, just memorizes the elements of the data. And it's a problem in AI. Uh, there's all kinds of things to combat it, but one of the easy ways we can use to combat it is just not training that much. Uh, particularly because GPT-2 is already pretty good at the job it's doing. And so for some of these others, you know, you'll see, now I want to get my big reveal. Let's find out. So now I want to get my big reveal doesn't exist in this file. Let's see, does big reveal exist? No, it hasn't even... The phrase big reveal is something that came from GPT-2's knowledge of English, not from this. But now I want to get my big reveal. Again, pretty plausible for some kind of a stream quote. Or it is my prerogative to disappoint. All right, I got to no. know. All right. The word prerogative, in fact, never appears in the quotes file. And yes, that does sound like Cam. Um, so... This is one of the big things is it's getting a lot of the kind of things that we do expect to see in the data set, in the real data set, but it's totally fake. Uh, during chat last night, during the uh, the LRL, Loading Ready Live bit, uh, one of the things that people were saying was like, oh, this, this quote can't be fake. It's got multiple ellipses in it. The bot would never generate that. And I kept just saying in chat that don't underestimate this bot. This bot can do anything in the sense of there are no restrictions on how it will structure text. All it's trying to do is paint a word picture that looks like the word pictures it's seen before. It is very much like these fake portrait generators, except instead of trying to make a picture that looks realistic, it's trying to put some words together that it thinks might appear somewhere on the internet. And in doing that, it's got everything at its disposal. It can use all caps. It can use words that don't exist. It can use... Uh, Oh, here, you know, little emoji tags of, you know, people's, uh, how people sound. Resigned voice. I prefer the open ocean over the sea. I'm betting that one's fake. Let's find out. Oh, no, so it learned resigned voice from here, but it wasn't, that wasn't the quote at all. So it learned resigned voice from a quote of Ian's, but then open ocean? No, the whole open ocean thing, it didn't pick up from the data at all. And this is kind of the thing. You can see sometimes little pieces of what it's grabbing from the data, but it's mixing it back up in interesting ways. It's basically mashing up language in order to generate strange quotes. All right, we've just got another four. And all right, so what we've just done now here 
is it's finished all 400 and now it's running the plagiarism check. So what you're seeing here is every quote is, gets printed to the terminal as it does it. And then if it finds a match for it, it then prints that match. Uh, and it'll actually print a match even if there's a match that's kind of quote, uh, close. Uh, though it looks like this is pretty well doing it. Oh, nice, here we go. We've also got occasionally, it does weird. I'm a sticky Denand. Go home, bot. You're you're drunk. But you can see here most of the things it's got here are are fake. And then occasionally the matches are things like this. Um, you know, streaming is just censored. But that kind of matches with what we actually did. Streaming is just yelling the voice lines of the game you're playing. And sometimes the uh, you know, the plagiarism added something there. So yeah, you can really see here most of these quotes not fake, not uh, or not plagiarized, actually fake. Um, and occasionally you also get things like this, where yeah, anything that contains the word that uh, gets noted as a very strong match, just because we do have a quote in the database that's just that. I may strip that from the database, but. All right. So what we see here, also that uh, that pattern thing, what we mentioned about it, the GPT likes coherence, is it occasionally just likes to repeat the same quote over and over and over. Yes, it's funnier with the bleeps. I mean, again, this thing does seem to be learning something about comedy, but then occasionally it also definitely reveals that it is an AI and not very smart. Oops, I have no idea why I just tried to run some of those, but there we are. Yeah. We do get things like this too, you know, just, uh, I'm worried about Ian. I'm worried about you. I'm worried about you. I'm worried about you. I'm worried about you. I think the record got kind of caught on that one uh, for, okay, that's maybe, I I've, yes, I do remember records and that's all we're gonna say about that. Um, but this content is, ranges from mediocre to broken to pretty funny. All right, so that was 400 rounds of training. And as we can see at the end of that, just shy of 75% of the quotes it was generating at that phase in training were novel. Uh, so let's go ahead now and jump over to the cooked machine. Let's see how it's doing. Because it's been grinding away on training for 2,000 cycles. Um, and so let's just go find the last checkpoint here. Children are not eligible for Amazon Prime. is a real quote. And can you bond faster? Is not a real quote. I was really expecting that to be somebody doing like some, uh, you know, assembling Warham figs on stream. But this, if we, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and we're going to kill this. So one of the things that I mentioned, we showed it was doing uh, checkpoints every 200 uh, iterations. So it checkpointed at 1400. All right, saved a checkpoint there, model 1457. And now it's, oh, nice. Apparently if I, that only, uh, a single control C only interrupts the training and then it goes on to quote generation. That is, I didn't expect that to happen. I thought I was gonna have to restart this process. So what we should get right now is we should see what it does when it generates quotes here from stage 1457. And yeah, here we go. So I don't know, Warpammer, I don't know. But look at the, the match rate here we're getting here. Now that we've actually asked it to generate at this point. Um, This is just, I, I currently haven't seen a quote that didn't match, and so far the quotes appear to be about 100%. Uh, like, not even like they're weak quotes, but they're very, very quotes. 
So this is one of the things that uh, that happens when you overfit. Um, and it didn't print it out because, yep, okay, there there is a bug in my quote code that generates the file names for uh, where to put the thing. I'll have to fix that. But yes, there we go. Novel quotes generated, one of 40. It generated 40 quotes, and we got one novel one. Let's see if we... Oh, there it is. Bananas are a universal constant. So... That one is supposed to be, uh, that one's novel. Let's see. Bananas are a property of matter. Absolute horse bananas. Bananas don't have hair. And botanically, bananas are a baby. So, okay, yeah, it, it really was nowhere near that. Let me, I'm also just going to check for universal constant. Ah. Spiders are a universal constant. So what's basically happened here is the one novel one is it found a noun that got used a couple of times and swapped it for a different for a noun in a different quote. And yeah, spiders are a universal constant. Hockey also a universal constant. So yeah, and yes, it does it does sound like a Kath quote, but apparently it's a piece of an Alex quote put together with the net. Wow. Bananas with a Surge quote, or an Ian quote, or a James quote, or an Adam quote, which are our four uh, bananas usages. All right, so that's kind of the problem with overtraining. Now, what we've basically got here, uh, so yeah, that, that's how anti-plagiarism works. Let me, I'll show you anti-plagiarism, actually, how that works. Um, so if we dive back down into my code, and we scroll down to here. Basically, all we are end up doing here. So we've got all of our quotes here. After we uh, generate the quotes, we basically use a regular expression to just go find anything that's between those start text, end text chunks and pull it out. And we ignore anything that wasn't generated between those. Uh, because if the model wasn't confident enough to put it between those, we're not confident they kind of complete entity. And then, unless we've turned off skip plagiarism, we basically go through every quote and we run it through a fuzzy match with literally every quote in the source database. So this is this can get slow um, because if it uh, if it there are no matches, it will have to for each of these look at everything in the source database every time. This algorithm is the number of quotes we generate times the number of quotes in the database, and that can get big. Uh, but after we do that, we spit it out to an output file. And we hang on to it, and it's good. Uh, and in the output file, also, we hang on to the quote, the best match that we had to it, and the match score, just in case we didn't, you know, it said, like, something was a, uh, you know, something was a, a plagiarism, but it really wasn't, like some of our ones that plagiarized to just that. You know, maybe we're, we feel better about it than the algorithm did. The algorithm is very, it's deliberately trying very hard to match. Um, and in fact, that's also why it, it, we're looking for anything with 90% uh, or less, because everything has 86% as far as the algorithm is concerned. Just everything it can find a match of at least 86% for. I am pretty sure that's the amount of edit distance it needs to completely delete the quote and type a new quote in. So, given all of that, let's go ahead and train this thing on something new. Mm. Yeah, the inefficiency of plagiarism checking is always part of why uh, Kyvex always wonders whether various other generative systems are actually running one or just hoping it's fine. Um, I am pretty strongly sure that uh, most systems are not doing plagiarism checking of this sort. Uh, and I think if you look at it, so actually generating things from the input data during training is a problem, and they're they're definitely doing some amount of that during training and checking for novelty. But I do think that for some of the text generators, if you're generating short text from a small corpus, there's the largest chance of plagiarism. As the size of the corpus goes up, the probability that you are just plagiarizing a couple of words at a time goes up. And I think at that point, the odds of finding a, a single source that has been plagiarized gets harder because one of the things that we are seeing is like it will take the structure from one sentence or the structure of thing you know, one set of things but start subbing things out within the same part of speech 
which, again, we've never taught it anything about parts of speech. There is no pre-existing knowledge of nouns or verbs or adjectives that goes into this. But one of the things it has to learn to predict is that if you substitute out, you know, if you take this one word out of a sentence, something like a, you know, an another noun is a more plausible entrant than something that isn't a noun. So it ends up having to kind of inherently learn some of that anyway. And so I think as the size of the data set goes up, the likelihood of directly quoting something from the input goes down. So, for example, I am pretty sure that when we look at like, you know, this person does not exist, we are very unlikely to get an image of somebody that exists or that was in the data set. But when we do text generation, and particularly if we can get GPT in toward a niche, we might get phrases from something else in that niche. So it is it is an interesting uh, problem space. I mean, there is a ton to it. But now let's let's plagiarize terribly. Because I did say I've got a second data set here. I've got Pokemon because, you know, Pokemon. And one of the things I noticed a bunch as I was playing with this early on when I was playing with GPT and before I was training it very much is occasionally it would just begin enthusiastically telling me about something. And it reminded me of my friend's, uh, my, my friend's elementary schooler who will tell me everything about whatever Pokemon they have most recently uh, you know, caught or decided is cool or whatever. And... When I think about that kind of enthusiasm and when uh, Kyvex was like, hey, I found a file with dumps of all of the flavor text from the Pokemon ROMs, I was like, two great tastes that AI great together. So we've got those files on here. Let's go ahead and we're going to take a look. We've got some checkpoints pre-saved on here. So let's go ahead and look at the checkpoint directory. These are runs we can pre-run, and we have the Poke Moves and Poke Species uh, checkpoints pre-saved. So this is, and this is basically GPT trained up uh, last night for some number of runs on the moves, the move list, and the species list. So let's take a look. Uh, I don't remember how many times I ran that, but we can go ahead and look in the checkpoint directory to find out. So let's checkpoint. Let's go look at Poke Species, and this is the species descriptions, by the way, not the uh, not the uh, species names. So, okay, we just ran, we ran this for 200 cycles on the descriptions of Pokemon species. So let's go ahead and just generate from that. So in order to do that, we're going to go grab ourselves, but uh, I should have that somewhere up here. There we go. So we're not going to fine tune this time. We're going to pick up from the run name Poke Species, and because this file uses different uh, columns, we've told it that the column with quotes is flavor text, and the column with attributions is name, which is just the name of the Pokemon. And we'll have it load Pokemon Species CSV to do uh, plagiarism detection, and then let's just say uh, output file. Poke species Gen 1 CSV. Let's have this thing generate us some new Pokemon species. Right, I moved that into a directory. So we're going to say inputs slash Pokemon species dot CSV. So this should run reasonably fast. It loads it. We've got 6206 quotes, which in this case are actually the descriptions of Pokemon. Whoa! It exploded! Excellent! What did I do wrong? Okay, um... Wow, okay, we went to generate quotes, and... Oh, it just went boom! Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, hang on. I see the problem. All right. Oh, you're right, on the terminal full screen. Thank you, Kyvex. Um, terminal, programming. So it just went, it, it went boom, and the problem is, so this program is a little bit finicky. I told it the run name, what I didn't tell it was reload. We need to add the reload instruction, or it doesn't attempt to reload from a prior run. So it just went and goes, okay, there's a run by this name, uh, you should work with it, and it never loads it into memory. And the, the AI code gets very confused and goes, you've told me there's a run, you've told me I should know about it, where is it? 
But if we add reload, this time it should actually load the, oh, sorry, I called it resume because of course I can very consistently name things. Resume, here we go. So this time it should pick up that. Again, yep, there we are, 807 Pokemon with 6206 uh, descriptions. And this time it actually loaded it from the Poke Species checkpoint here. And now we're generating some quotes. Oh, I have slid. The problem with rolly chairs is I slowly slide out of the camera spot that's actually on camera. There we are. So what it's doing right now, generating those quotes, and it's again just going to generate one batch of them. And now it's going to do a start of plagiarism. So it knows a lot of things here. Uh, we have some nice alternate Diglett. When Diglett approaches prey, it will use its tail to stab the prey hole with its sharp claws. This is really nice uh, dark Diglett here. It doesn't like to fight. Instead, it will chase after its trainer until the opportunity arises. Uh, so, yeah, these are, this definitely has the feel of Pokemon characters, you know, Pokemon descriptions. Um, even though it's small, it can easily absorb air and float to the rear. Although it has a very sharp sense of direction, it doesn't use it very often because its brain cells can't distinguish between different kinds of flowers. So, as you can see, with only 200 rounds of training, we're generating some reasonably plausible Pokemans. Um, part of the thing is, because the data set is so small, we don't want to train very much. In fact, 200 rounds of training is, you know, quite a bit on this. Um, but as you can see, we're also getting, you know, nothing is kicking over the plagiarism check. Nothing is actually a exact quote of other things. Um, it does love, uh, though, and this is part of, I feel like, that... Uh, elementary schooler feeling is it loves to say things three times or n times you know sea king is a skilled swimmer and swimmer about standing technique it is very protective of its territory being adept at swimming it can freely swim backward i get the impression it's good at swimming all right and yeah that time 27 out of 27 novel quotes so if we need to build ourselves some new pokemon we can do this you know it emits a strong magnetic force that can carry it to the distant future. I'm just saying, you know, uh, Pokemon Company, uh, if you want to call me, I, I, I could have generations, uh, you know, N through lots here. We, we have lots of new generations of Pokemon ready for you, and you don't need to, like, you just find an artist, get them to draw this. Okay, that may be a future stream if... Uh, if anybody knows an artist who'd be interested in doing some improv drawing, uh, I would love to uh, team up with an artist and stream having my AI come up with terrible, terrible art prompts, and we run with it, because that entertains me. Teach another AI to draw. <laughs> we could. Oh god, we could. Um... All right, so something I've been meaning to do. So one of the things I've been told that uh, this system is bad at is actually generating novel words. So let's make it do that. Because why not, right? Um, oh, God, for AI affinity. Oh, I, I am pretty sure that that would uh, badly, badly violate the, uh, the rating of my stream. This is a this is a family stream. All right. So what I do want to do here, what we're going to do, I'm going to give this a new name. So we're going to change the parameters of this just a little bit. First of all, we're not going to resume. We're going to fine tune. Fin tune. No, fine tune. Run name. We're going to call this Poke Names. And all that we're going to do here is we're going to swap the uh, the quote column flavor text. Nope, that's going to be name. And the attribution column is going to be flavor text. And part of this is this system currently needs to see an attribution column or it freaks out a bit. Um, and we're going to go ahead, we'll output this oh, poke names, gen1.csv, inputs, Pokemon species.csv. Okay, so what we're going to do, we're going to fine tune on this. And we're going to, let's just have this 
I'm going to adjust the parameters just a little here um, because I want to, I really want to see what this does at very short intervals. I expect this is going to overtrain really fast. So let's bring up Chrome uh, and let's go ahead and look at the command line that we can do here. Hey, command line. All right. We're going to try a few things. So we're going to tell it uh, one that it should uh, carry We're going to have it carry out steps. Let's say, oh, we'll have to do 200 steps. Um, we're going to uh, have it uh, end sample. Uh, no, I don't think we need to change end samples. I'm going to tell it to save checkpoints fairly frequently in case we need to uh, early terminate. Save every 10. We're also going to tell it to sample every 10. So after every 10, it's going to try to generate us some new fake Pokemon. Um, and there we go. We've got our output file, Pokemon Gen 1. Oh, whoops, sample every 10. All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to see what happens as this goes. Back to just the terminal. Also, chat, please do keep it clean. Please. I really would not like to have my channel uh, re-rated by Twitch. All right. So... Here we go. We are, it has built up 6206 quotes by which we mean Pokemon names. And it is now kicking off the data set with the pre existing tokens. We're going to see what happens. Um, we're going to go ahead and watch this since in just 10 iterations we should have an answer to what the first one does. Um, all right. So the loss function is already fascinating. Normally, when we start training, our, the, the loss function begins around two and takes some time to come down. But it, it's already picking this up really fast, even after just the first epic of training. Ten may have been too big. We'll know soon. All right, so here we go. We got eight. Nine, coming right up on finding out what's going to happen. So actually, Warpammer, that's interesting. The uh, the inconsistent voice in the uh, data set being discussed, um, that's actually not a problem for GPT because you can you can prompt GPT. Exactly, like Kybex is saying. It's true of the original GPT-2 training that the data set is just incredibly diverse. Whoa! Okay, so first of all, it did not learn in the slightest that it needs, yet, that it needs the, uh, what's it called? The delimiters. But it has figured something, it, it definitely understands that video games are the space we're talking about. You know, the three of them did all right in the round against Iglybuff. Let, let's start with the thing we're proudest of, the 3DS. I believe we're looking at part of a Nintendo press release here. So, yeah, we're seeing chunks of Nintendo press releases, chunks of strategy guides, chunks of people talking about, you know, possibly some Let's Plays. Uh, so let's see as it goes on. So we're now, 20, we're now 10 more in. See if it's figured out that all we're looking for is names. Because all we've given it is the names. And we are really badly abusing GPT at this point. GPT is not meant to try to come up with single words. But, but it did. And I have no idea. Many of those I recognize. Some of them I don't recognize. Uh, okay, yeah, I recognize many of those. Uh, but I don't know if some of the Dusclops, is Dusclops a Pokemon? Is Zoroar a Pokemon? I don't know. I, I think actually we're going to cut this off right now because we've already gone far enough. If we go any further, we're going to overtrain. Um, okay, so 
yeah, at at 10 iterations, it hadn't figured out what a Pokemon name is. At 20 iterations, I believe we had hit absolute full uh, full things here. That that is true, uh, Tian Kalek, and uh, also it's a real Pokemon name. By the way, the Pokemon looks not. Yeah, I'm really surprised from a kids game. I'm really surprised. Uh, okay, so it generated two novel out of fifty-five. What were the two novel things we got out of all of that? Um, Cause wow. Um, Now we're playing that, that difficult game of find... Oh, there we are. Dabora. Dabora is new. Okay. And, uh... There should be another one here somewhere. Razlit. I see somebody say, where where was that? Razlit is the other new one. I, I completely... Oh, there it is. Yep. Razlit. That is plausible. That is distressingly plausible. Yes, a Mark like we were talking about earlier with Markov generators, a letter-based Markov generator for Pokemon names would probably be way more effective than this. Um, part of why I'm doing this is to kind of show off the weakness here of GPT-2. But I'm I am impressed that like okay, I have to find out now. Yeah, what is Razlet? Like, is this a word from the corpus? Oh yeah, horsey. It's a, it's a seahorse Pokemon. I actually know that one from the time the the period I spent playing Pokemon Go. All right, so I'm gonna bring up a Chrome here. We're gonna we're gonna try something terrifying in just for just a moment. We're going to ask the internet what something is. We're just gonna put in the word Razlet into Google. Okay, yep, appears to be a YouTuber. So it's figured out, it, it has seen the word, and it has seen it in the association of uh, gaming. And it's been like, you know, that that, that world feels kind of Pokemon-y. That word, it, it's, it's Pokemon-esque. Um, but I have no idea what about it triggered it to come up in the Pokemon. But okay, I, I was curious whether it could generate a totally novel word. And yeah, what was that other one we had that was totally novel? Uh, of course, now I don't remember it. Um, if anybody remembers the other uh, the other word, I'm curious. We'll punch that in. Uh, oh, Dabora, right? It was. So if we try Dabora, looks like uh, Dabora is a Dragon Ball character. <laughs> Okay, um, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying this doesn't look like a Pokemon, but, y you know, yeah, I, I feel like, I, I feel like this could work. So, okay, this is kind of where we get into stuff that, uh, yeah, GPT is not good at generating brand new words. It did find some words, it figured out it was looking for one word pretty quickly, and it found words that kind of fit the set, but yeah, not really good at finding individual words. All right, so uh, let's see. So we've got the the, uh, the Pokemon Moves data set, by the way. I could show some generation from that, but honestly, the Pokemon Moves were not as fun because it just generated some plausible but not real Pokemon Moves, but there's kind of a vocabulary to Pokemon Moves. It Okay, actually, I guess it's a little impressive, so let's go ahead and let it generate some Pokemon moves. We're going to reload from the run name Pokemoves. The quote column is flavor text, the attribution column is name. Excuse me, yep. And we're going to output two Pokemoves, gen1.csv. And we're going to use inputs Pokemon moves. And let's go ahead and uh, we'll let you actually see my uh, terminal here a little better. Boom. 
All right. If I have done everything correctly, we should be able to generate some stuff here. With... Right, I copied the one where I had written it wrong. I may need to add reload as an alias to resume for my own use. All right, so this is attempting to get the move descriptions. And we've just, this was just, I trained it for 100 iterations, and we're just going to have it generate from those previous 100 iterations and see what we get. All right. All right. So, as you can see, these are kind of plausible Pokemon moves, but they aren't real. The user throws a punch at maximum power. It has a high critical hit ratio. A chilling shockwave crashes down on the target. It may freeze the target solid. I mean, if and it does figure out things like chilling and freeze tend to belong together. You know, a chilling shockwave crashes down on the, on the foe. It may leave the target frozen. And if some of these moves seem plausible, but not good, like the user faints when its ally faints. This also lowers the ally's attack stat. Pokemon, please don't use that move. That, that feels like a bad move. But as we can see, like this was only 100 rounds of iteration, and it learned to generate some fairly plausible Pokemon moves. Uh, this is uh, also some of the technique that we get, you know, for Robo Rosewater. And this is again uh, one of the problems that uh, I recall they they raised with uh, Robo Rosewater was that it it was easy to train Robo Rosewater, which is the fake. Uh, so Mark Rosewater is of course a magic designer. Uh, for folks who aren't familiar with Magic's Gathering, uh, and Robo Rosewater is a bot that generates text for magic cards. Not the flavor text, but the uh, the mechanics text of magic cards. It may also generate flavor text, but uh, names and things. But it reached a point very quickly where the mechanics that it was generating were just kind of plausible. They just kind of, yeah, that, we could do, I mean, they, they probably aren't balanced. They're probably not you know, good magic cards, but they're not funny, haha, -ha, and AI doesn't know what it's doing. They're, yep, that sure is a 6-8 with trample and something? I don't know. So there is kind of an art of that sort of thing. Oh, hey, so yes, Shateri found a uh, text list of Pokemon. Actually, I've got a text list of Pokemon because I have the same one we've been feeding, and a Markov generator that can take a list. So let's see what happens if we go ahead. Let's open that link in a new tab. Oh, in a new tab over there. Now let's bring that over into this window. And let's let's see what happens if we do that. All right, so yeah, let's go ahead and uh, try the list of, uh, oh, yeah, that is great. Yeah, Mastor, Skibavi, Mary Pino, what the? So, yeah, Markov Chain is doing rather a better job of that than our GPT did. Um, so, in fact, yeah, it, it's, we've got some great results there from uh, Shateri's use of that run, so I'm not going to bother bringing that up myself. <laughs> yeah, what the is very uh, something. Yeah. All right, so. Yeah, the moves the moves rate is okay. Um, now, one of the things we could do, and this is now we're getting into some places for future advancement. Uh, you saw I do have that attribution data, and we play with it, but we don't do much with it. Uh, one of the things I've been wanting to try is to actually have the code after it trains on one thing, train on another to kind of fine tune a little further. We can fine tune from a different pickup point. So, let's try something stupid. Let's try something real dumb. We're going to take the uh, the run that we overtrained on Lur. So let's just go ahead and make sure we can run from the over the Lur overtrained uh, corpus. So we have the resume run name. Actually, before I do that, I need to check uh, ls checkpoint. All right, the run name was Lur overfit. So we're going to resume from Lur overfit. And I just want to demonstrate what Lure Overfit does, in part to make sure that I remember what we have here. All right, we're going to 
get rid of the quote column, get rid of the attribution column because it by default uses the right stuff there. And then our output file is just going to be uh, overfit gen one CSV and our input file will not be the Pokemon moves. It will be Lure quotes. All right, so we're going to run the overfit and have it generate one batch for us. So this should go pretty quickly. Um, and remember, this is the one that when we used it before, when we stopped it, basically generated stuff that was just, it was just quoting Lure. So this, this particular, you know, this particular instance of the bot is not, uh, it, it's past the point of diminishing returns and is just quoting things from the original set or was when we were playing with it earlier. And what we're gonna do with this is we're gonna see what happens. I'm not going to read that first quote, wow. It's it's not plagiarism, but I'm not going to read it. <laughs> um, so as we can see, it's matching most of the time and when it didn't match, it generated things I'm not going to say. Um, all right. So what we're going to do now is we're going to see what happens if instead of taking uh, GPT, base GPT, and teaching it how to do Pokemon moves, we're going to try teaching this GPT that has basically gone deep down the lure hole to generate Pokemon, uh, well, not moves, uh, Pokemon descriptions, since they were more entertaining. So, all right, we're going to need to use one of the arguments I haven't been using. So let's go ahead and bring up Chrome so I can look at it here. Oops, not GPT-2 train. Here we go. We want restore from. So restore from is kind of a little magic trick. Restore from lets us pick up one run and then use it to begin a different one. So we're gonna do that. So instead of resume, we are gonna be fine tuning today. Actually, let's go ahead to, here we go. So step one, we're telling, we're going to tell the system it's time to fine tune. Restore from lure overfit. The run name here will be uh, Lurmon. We're going to use the quote column of flavor text, the attribution column of name. Our output file will be Lurmon Gen 1 CSV. And our inputs will not be Pokemon moves, it will be Pokemon species. All right, so before we go too much further here, this is again since Pokemon species overtrains pretty easily, and because this cross training thing is weird and unpredictable, we're going to set a couple of different parameters. We're going to have it uh, save every five, sample every five. So this is going to be every five uh, steps of training. It'll spit out some stuff for us to look at and also save its progress. So if we abort, it will let us pick back up from right there. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we'll let it do some uh, plagiarism detection at the end. And here we go. Let's go back. We don't need to look at the browser anymore. So fine tuning the model from training data. See if I remembered how to correctly cross train a model. I think I did. We'll know soon. All right. Oh, can't load save path when it's none. Hmm. What did I do wrong? Um, hang on. LRR dash overfit, that is correctly spelled. Oh, right, okay. So this is an annoyance that I have to uh, clean up a little bit in the sit tool. When we do restore from, we actually need to tell it exactly where it's restoring from, so. We're gonna restore from, it's not just give it the name, we need to give it this thing. GPT quote generator slash checkpoint slash lure overfit. That was the problem. All right. I will need to improve that later. 
but this time it should be able to actually load the checkpoint from that directory. Yeah, basically the code that automatically looks in that directory is not used on this one path. It's annoying. But here we go. We should get some fun, exciting things, I hope. I'll be confident as soon as uh, we see training begin. Okay, there we go. That time it loaded from the overfit, and now we're beginning to train. Here we go. So what we should see here is all kinds of fun, exciting uh, things coming out every five, uh, every five sessions. And oh yeah, look at that loss. Look at that loss. I remember said before, you know, we normally get a loss of like two when we first start training something. This loss is incredible. This is, it's really wrong. It's, it's optimized in the wrong direction, but it's very quickly picking up toward where we want it to be. But the loss function is still pretty high. Now, one commonality between these two is that they both use the begin end token. So it may or may not remember that. On past cross trainings, one of the uh, one of the things I got was one that just spit out begin end tokens, and that was all it did. Because the only thing it felt sure about was that we sure do delimit things with begin end tokens. But we'll know in a moment. Oh, wow. Um. So it it, it has parts. Parts and parts and parts. Um, I I don't even know what to say about that. I I just wow. Uh, parts like an auto zone exactly. Oh man, let's see if ten has gotten it a little better. Okay, so it's forgotten how to do the begin end token somewhat, but it's got some stuff now. Yeah, its bodyguards become invisible when it wakes up. As with all its cousins, it's not known for its stealth. This is why it can't be seen using its ears. Its tongue can't break the air around it. So they're they are definitely Pokemon-ish, but they feel further afield than our earlier stuff, which is actually kind of interesting. Uh, let's see what we look like at 15. I'm hoping that by the time we get to one of these, we'll, we get one that consistently... There we are. We have good tokens. So I'm going to go ahead and call it here for a moment because I want to see what it does with this. Um, because at this point, it has learned kind of the phraseology of Pokemon descriptions, but it has not yet tuned into their language. So, you know, it's known to come in contact with other creatures such as flies, but can't be seen in that area. So it's figured out the structure of a Pokemon description some... Okay, so we've crashed. And the reason we've crashed is... This code does have a known crash where if, when it generates, it doesn't actually generate anything with uh, the correct uh, tokens, that we get it divide by zero when it tries to figure out how many quotes were good. Uh, so let's go ahead and we're going to try regenerating from here a little bit. Instead of fine tuning, we're going to now uh, reload. Or no, resume, resume. We're not going to use restore from this time because it's already done that work. So now we've got this Lermon here. And expected one argument. Oh, restore from. I deleted the argument to it and left out and left in the actual command. All right. Let's see what happens now. And we can leave in those save every and sample every. It just won't do anything because we don't ask it to save or sample. So what I'm hoping is if we rerun this, that maybe it will uh, actually remember its tokens for a change. Otherwise, we may need to give it a few more cycles of training. But yeah, it does sound that kind of like Pokemon had a sentence level of high school instead of elementary. It's got, yeah, this more internet level text, but it's still, it kind of knows what it's talking about. Nope. Nope, it is. Okay, we're gonna give it a cup. We're gonna give it just a couple more uh, passes on the training. Let's uh, 
we're going to let it, uh, yeah, fine tune. So fine tune automatically resumes from where it picked where it was, uh, and we're going to tell it uh, here save every one sample every one because quark a variable that sounds like it's written by an annoyed chocobo absolutely so i see you are and that actually kind of does split the difference as well between uh you know wark and que so python the chocobo language and or the snakes language i don't know all right so now we're going to fine tune and after every pass we're going to have it give us some info because I don't want to sort of wait too long on this one. We're we are going to pass a uh, sweet spot pretty quickly. And this is actually something else to note. Like train, it does not always get better with training. You can see, I think those extra two or three cycles it did before I uh, pulled actually made it get worse again. So that can happen. That's uh, special. This is probably the last experiment I'm going to do on stream today because I did uh, plan to stream for about two hours because uh, you know, this is all kind of motivated by the cool project with the uh, LRR folks and uh, Ian and uh, Corey are, wait, no, is it Ian and Corey? No, I've got the wrong folks for uh, Rhythm Cafe. It's uh, Ian and, uh, oh my God, I all remember her Twitch name, Lunar Jade. I've just lost her name. Heather, Heather, thank you. Ian and Heather are going to be doing Rhythm Cafe shortly, and I'm planning to go over to that. So uh, if you want to join me, we'll uh, we'll go over and uh, do a bit of uh, Twitch rating at the end of the stream here. Go join in on that. But uh, I want to finish up this little weird project first. Um, okay, there we go. There we go. We're going to stop there because this one's pretty good. Hypescout here was briefly known as Pinchy Pokemon. It is sometimes seen as the Pokemon of the Great Plains. All right, so now let's see if at this at this checkpoint we get some decent results because yeah. Damn you. It does reasonable stuff until I ask it to generate uh without uh you know, until I ask it to generate and then it forgets how to do delimiters again. I just really want to see what happens when we run this thing yet. <laughs> it has many powerful jaws that sprout out and sprout jaws. Yeah, I just want to see what happens when we run this thing and run it through plagiarism detection, because I'm really curious uh, what the closest matches are for some of these. But... Ah, well, this this one right here. This is my favorite uh, poke new Pokemon. ASCII symbol Pokemon. So we've we've definitely got, like it has a leafy pink spot. It conducts its rays without the need for electricity. The blue rays of the sun burn bl burn brighter. It is impossible to tell if a dog is stoking its nose or if it is stoking its nectar. <laughs> and this is why, by the way, we don't take advice from GPT. The maximum temperature of a pet is 75 degrees Fahrenheit. It really wants us to know that. It's told us three times. <laughs> Apparently, it's impossible to tell if a pet is stoking its nose. It is impossible to tell if a pet is stoking its nose. It searches for its prey by walking on it. It has a happy demeanor when it listens to its surroundings. So, yeah, if we take some of these, uh, these, these have definitely uh, brought, a, brought things to a place, um, but you can see... By the time it reached coherency, we've really, we've lost a lot of the, the lure. There's no real uh, lure feeling to this. Uh, now, I suppose one of the interesting questions would be what would happen if we were to put both those source files in, but we can't do that. 
the script is not currently equipped to do that. I mean, GPT can do that, but the script is not currently equipped to let me put in multiple source files from different uh, places. So, if you are interested, one of the big things that uh, I would l I'd love to do more messing about with this kind of stuff. And if this is something that interests you, let me know. Um, so quick, uh, quick tour of uh, ways to reach me. So first of all, please do feel free. Uh, check out my GitHub. Check out this repo. Star it. Watch it. Pull it down. Play with it. Please. I would love to see your terrible, horrible results. And if you've got ideas for it, you know, go ahead, open up some issues. Let me know what you find. I am happy to collaborate with folks on this uh, cool little project. Yeah, if you find issues, put them in bug reports. Let me know. If you generate cool things, um, put those in bug reports too. Open an issue. I don't know. Uh, let me know. That you can also uh, reach me uh, on the you know through through my GitHub. Um, I am on the Patreons, which I was not smart enough to have preloaded here. But I will be putting posting this video to the Patreons after we are done uh, processing it and things. And I'll be attaching all of these random things we generated today and some data from the console and things. Um, this is not my job. I am not a professional streamer. I am a professional programmer. Um, I work for a software company and make software. So... The fact that I have literally nobody uh, on Patreon right now is not actually a bother for me. It does not impair my ability to put food on the table. But if people are interested and want to follow me on Patreon, that's one way I know that people are interested in me doing this sort of stuff. And I'll clear more time on my calendar to make this stuff happen uh, because I'm having fun doing this. But it's really only fun when there's a conversation. Uh, also, if for whatever reason, because I'm trying to get better at this whole self-promotion thing, Kyvex and I, if you are looking for us, for whatever reason, you can reach us. We are Ideal Abstraction at idealabstraction.com. And if you just want to grab some time with us and hang out with us and talk to us about software or ask questions or get mentoring or coaching, we will literally do that. We will. You can pay us to get on a video call with you during these quarantine times and help you with anything you're interested in about the software industry. Um, I'll tell you, it's not, uh, you know, we're, we're not exactly inexpensive, but we're really experienced and we know a ton about this stuff. So if you're looking to help with, for help with projects like this, let us know. Uh, Kyvex, is there anything else that I have forgotten to mention from a uh, reminding people of the ways they can get in touch with me perspective? Um, obviously, I'm here. Um, I keep a somewhat irregular streaming schedule, so do do hit the follow button because... We will, uh, if you follow me, you'll find out when I'm streaming. I frequently, if I'm just working on a personal project, I will just hop on here and stream. Uh, if you take a look at the VODs for the last few days, you'll get to see me setting up the EC2 instances we used today and uh, making sure that all of this code runs on them faster than it runs when I run locally. But other than that, uh, I'm around the internet. I'm not on Twitter, so you can't follow me there because uh, I'm not on Twitter. I'm also not on Facebook. If you find me there, it's probably me, but I haven't touched that account in a long time. So if you send a request, not much is going to happen. If you find me on LinkedIn, I'm on LinkedIn. It's not very exciting, it's like a resume, but a social network. I don't know who thought resumes needed to be social networks, but now resumes need to be social networks. Um, and I just realized, of course, that I was just all telling you you could uh, check out my Patreon. And I thought I was showing it to you. And because I am a thoroughly professional streamer, not, um, I didn't actually have my browser showing. So this, it's my Patreon, Patreon, Brain Better. Uh, you can go to my Patreon at Brain Better. That's the Patreon. Um, as you can see, it is very expensive. And we give you notifications of what's going on and share this stuff with you. Um, but broadly, yeah, we just... We just want to know that you're out there, that you're interested, follow, yeah, all that good stuff. And uh, as I said with uh, the repo here, I also tried to show you my repo and didn't show you the repo. So let's go back to that repo, github.com slash jwoodica. This is me. This is me loading very slowly. Hey, there we go. So, yep, right here. This is me. Feel free. You can reach out. 
you can find info about me. You can find my very out of date website. You can find out what I've been working on and programming on. And if you go to GPT, I should probably I'll pin this one to be one of the uh, ones on the homepage. But uh, Jay Woodka, GPT quote generator, you can pull this code down yourself and play with it. Um, and I again really really hope you will because this is why we do this stuff. This is like. I build this stuff for fun because I'm excited. Oh, yeah, uh, the avatar. Thank you. Uh, the avatar is by an artist uh, who goes by uh, every captain. Uh, I think uh, Noah Reynolds, a, a local uh, local artist here in uh, Flint Town between Washington and Illinois. Uh, they're really awesome. Did that for me. And yeah, that's uh, I use that everywhere. So. That's me. That's how you can find me, support me, get more of these streams. Again, thank you all for being here. We're going to go ahead and take this off the air.